back once again, Chuck Billy, frontman of Testament. What's going on, Chuck? What's happening? How you doing, Jimmy? Are you going on a grocery run? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm a Home Depot run. <laughs> okay. Yes, I remember you used to renovate, or you still do, right? You renovate homes and yeah. you do that fix and sell. Right? Yeah. Still flipping houses. Um, right now, I'm, I'm not because I were finishing, we were writing the record for the last six months and started recording in May. Oh. So I wanted to keep my plate clear and all my time focused on making the new record. All right. So since you start off with the record, just let me ask you this, if I can. Have you uh, have the bass tracks been laid down, the drums, bass, guitar, and now there's vocals left, or where are you at? Um, the drums are finished, and half the vocals are done, and most of the guitars. No leads or bass yet. Steve's out on tour with uh, Death to All, and um, Alex is usually waits till Eric's done with all rhythms. Okay. But we're trying to get it accomplished. We leave July 10th, so we're trying to get it all recorded before then. Did you do a lot of uh, writing? I, I, you have been, because I've asked you these questions before. You guys have been writing for a long time, right? So a lot of uh, pre-studio yeah, work? We started since November. Since about November, we started working, and through the holidays, Chris has been coming out working with Eric a lot. And uh, and then into this beginning of this year, he's came out dozens of times and really has put a lot of fire under Eric and getting him fired up and, and writing some pretty aggressive stuff. You know, he's some really challenging stuff for Eric. Chris is, uh, he's a young guy, 25 years old, uh, really fast, great drummer. So it's, you know, a little breath of some new life into the band and into the writing really, um, which is exciting. You know, we're, we're, we always write different things for every record. And once again, this is another Testament record that's going to have, some new stuff that we're exploring and, and stepping into. So it's, we're looking forward to this one. Would you say it's a progression from last album? Yeah, but I think last record, you know, I think I stayed in one vocal tone and range where this one um, doing a little bit of everything, some death, death metal vocals, classic Testament style vocals. And then we actually have, I don't want to say ballad, but we got a, slower song that has a lot of feeling how's that like um that. <laughs> and we haven't done that in a long time so um there's a little bit of everything but staying true to the band you know are, are you are you writing all the lyrics i write most of them with I, i've been writing with del james um del he's he works with guns of roses he's been working with them and wrote with them a long time ago i think his big hits like November rain with them. And, mm -hmm. and we've been working for over 20 years. So I always go down and work with them because I come with a lot of the ideas and concepts, but he really interprets and gets the right words, how to say what I'm thinking. And we have, it's a really good, we work fast when we get together, we'll, we'll knock out like two songs in a day. So we, we don't mess around. We get there, say hello to each other. We sit down and we go right to work. You know, it's about what we do. All right. Well, that's good news. I'm happy to hear it. Like I always love the lyrics of Testament. You know, you're always touching on different sort of subjects and they always very metal those subjects, <laughs> especially I, I've always said this. I think your best work in Testament has been the last few albums. Not to say that I don't like the first albums. I'm just saying, I think you guys get better. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, you know, I, I honestly have to say after I beat cancer and we had the original lineup back together, everything kind of changed because, you know, we've always been like in a friendly competition with better artists, you know, watching what's going on and mm -hmm. who's doing what. And I think around that point, once we got together and I felt like, you know, I didn't think I was going to play music anymore, first of all. And once I had the chance to get back with the original band, I felt very blessed. Like, wow, this this is I'm getting a, an opportunity to do what I love to do again. But also with the guys I started with, it's kind of odd that we're going to go back at this now, maybe trying to finish something that we all started together. And, and once we did that, it was um, enjoying our company you know, we never fight. We never argue. It, it was just like 
relaxing and, and the critics, we didn't care what the press thought or a lot of mm -hmm. people. Yeah, I mean, we wrote for ourselves. So a lot of those records were just making us happy. The songs we were writing, we weren't thinking about, okay, this has to be, you know, for this and, and, you know, where's our radio song and what's the fans going to think if we went and did a ballad, you know, all that went out the door. And I think over the time, it's really just about making good music, having fun at this point. And every record is a challenge because you always want to do better and make the Rex record sound better, have better songs. And um, I think where we're at today, you know, it, it, once again, especially having Chris, the new drummer, we are progressing. You know, me and Eric actually said, like, I don't know, about three weeks ago, we're hanging out. And, you know, like I said, the, the music's pretty aggressive and we're doing some heavy stuff. And he said, did you ever think in our 60s we we're going to be playing thrash metal music, writing songs like this? And I'm like, actually, no, but that's a good thing that we still feel young at heart and young in our minds and and still believe that, you know, we're, we're not struggling to do it, you know? Well, I mean, interesting enough, the Clash of the Titans tour was, you know, one of your early name. That was the name of one of your earlier tours. Now you're using that sort of sequence or that model once again, right? But this time, and this is a good segue, by the way, Chuck, uh, you got festival dates in the summer. Then I think it's September or at the end of August, September is when you start the Clash of the Titans tour in North America, correct? That's right. With Creator and Possessed, which is going to be an awesome tour. Very awesome. And that, that all kind of started. We went with Creator to South America last year. And, you know, when you're in South America, you're traveling together. You're always in a small backstage somewhere, always at the same hotel. So we spent a lot of time together and we had a good time. And we got along great. Crews got along great. And we're like, you know, sad this is going to end. Maybe we should think about trying to put something together. And we did. So we we got the American tour lined up. And then straight after that, we go to Europe with Creator and Anthrax. So it's going to continue yes. right in through the end of the year. And since we are releasing the Legacy in New Order um, remastered one. versions, we're, we're going to be playing a set of the Legacy New Order from this summer all the way through the end of the year. So it's definitely going to full circle, revisiting those old feelings and songs. So what does it feel like? Okay. Okay. You're, you got, you're 60. I guess you're about 60 years old now, right? 62. You're 62. And then your opening state or now your opening statement, one of your statements was, I can't, I, we're playing thrash at 62 years old. I mean, what did you think you're, you know, when you were young in your early twenties and you're going out on tour and you're supporting the legacy and New order, what did you really think the future was? I mean, um, honestly, for me, I mean, I always had this premonition that I was going to not live past 38. I don't know why, but I always had that age and date. And then I got diagnosed with cancer at 38. And I thought, oh, shit, here it is. Mm -hmm. I was right. My premonition's going to happen. And I went and seen three metal with chemotherapy and natural drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I believe that really got me through that and coming out of it. There's a lot of crazy stuff that happened during my illness that miracle. I'm not going to use that word, but I, I made it through it. You know, I had some things and complications that I had to get through and somehow my body just recovered from it. And um, here I am today, you know, still making music after that. So it was just weird, the premonition to where what happened to me and the way I got through it and and didn't really think, okay, when I was in my 20s, 40 years old was an old man. <laughs> you know, I when I was in my I 20s, this. I was thinking, 45 guy, that guy, that's an old guy. My grandpa's 50, you know? And so, you know, you thought that was old. And so now we're, we're beyond that going, wow. And here we are, still think we're young at heart, young in the mind, and still trying to go as fast as we did back then. The legacy. What's the legacy of the legacy? Going back in time well, now. Well, I mean, you know, looking back, you know, especially after getting a chance to go back and remaster those records, um, you know, because after 35 years, we retained the rights back for our, our songs with Atlantic. So we have yeah. the legacy in New Order. Practice is coming up this year, Souls next year. When we went to remaster it is really when we got to sit down 
and really listen to the records because when you're in a master room, things just sound different. They're, the speakers are great. The system, the EQ, it's much different. So when we put on the 1987 mix and master, it sounded so compressed and so small. But when in 1987, we didn't care. We held that record in our hands with a smile saying, we got, a record. Around the block. we got a record deal. We don't care how it sounds. It sounds great. You know, it's coming through the speakers, you know, it's on the radio. Wow, this is awesome. Um, but revisiting it, you know, especially over the years, making so many records, we knew that every time I heard that record, New Order or Legacy come on the radio, it sounded so compressed and so back in that dated time that we're like, man, I wish we, this could, the world could hear the way this really should sound like in today's modern age. And so when we got the chance to remaster it, um, man, it just it just became huge. We A B'd them together and we're like, wow, what a difference. Man, they've got bass, you got bottom end. It's it's walloping now. The guitars are so thicker and heavier. And it just was night and day, you know. But the, it, the, the performance was there, it just the technology wasn't there for us. So you have the masters to the legacy, is that what you're saying? Yeah, we actually in ninety or in two thousand and one, actually right when I was ill, we had asked Atlantic if we could remix the legacy in New Order, and they didn't want to cooperate, so we decided to record them again, the the songs off of those two records, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and that's kind of what sparked Alex and everybody coming back to the band at that time, and so, you know, that's kind of what started the search for the two inch master recordings. And um, since Atlantic wouldn't cooperate, we said, okay, let's just re-record them. So we kind of put that to bed. And then once we retained the rights back, we said, okay, let's let's remix now. So we started to try to find them and we reached out to Johnny Z and Johnny Z swore that, Chuck, I asked you, if what do you want me to do with these two inch tapes? And he said, I didn't respond or, I didn't answer the email. And so he threw them away. And I said, Johnny, how could you do that? You, you know how important a two inch recording, the only recordings are important to a band. And so I went to Atlantic, couldn't find him in the vaults, went to Alex Perry, Alex at pyramid sound, couldn't find them. So um, they're gone. Oh, so at that oh, point man. we're like, okay, Johnny did send me some stuff. Let, let me see, you know, what is in this box of goodies he sent me. And so I opened it up and I did find the half inch um, reels of unmastered mixes of both oh. records. Oh. So I'm like, oh, okay, at least now we could at least remaster them. It's not what we ex want to do, but it's at least better than we can do by just taking that CD that's been compressed and try to make it better. So that's good news. That's great. Got, yeah. So new order as well, right? You, you, it's a new order situation. as well. Yeah. You don't have it. Okay. Good. Well, that's great news. It's it's gone. Yeah. What, what do you remember when you recorded Legacy in the studio? Now you're, you're what, the pressure, not a lot of time. What do you remember back then? Well, it was a lot of fun. I mean, we put a lot of, you know, I mean, I worked hard for a year learning them songs and getting that technique because, you know, for me, I had to learn all those songs and thrash was a new element for me, you know, so I really had to learn what the guys were about, what thrash metal was about, how to apply vocals to thrash metal because I was taking lessons, learning how to sing rock songs and, and you know, being taught like that, not taught thrash metal. Mm -hmm. And once I got into playing thrash metal, it was all about the timing of the drums and singing to the pace of the beat with a little less melody. It's really more speed in the vocal and timing of it. So I really had to, you know, do what I learned, but also do it, you know, convert it into what I was learning with Eric. They kind of put me through boot camp mm -hmm. of learning how to sing like that. You know, so once I did that, we spent a lot of time when we got the record deal, you know, I had only sang a three song demo up to that point. I'd never mm -hmm. done anything else after that. So we flew to Ithaca, New York, kids from California, never seeing the snow in the Bay area to being thrown in upstate New York in the snow. 
given a vehicle and we we're like we we're just excited to leave home we all lived at home at the time we're going to make a record very exciting we're on a label that had metallica and working with anthrax and sod and mod and all the, the bands that we were inspired by and um and we just left it up to alex we didn't know how to make a record we didn't know miking techniques or you know proper tone or anything we just plug it in the amps okay that sounds that sounds good let's go let her rip and and you're lucky enough he captured the energy of what we were trying to do back then you know you know well, then you you know you're hitting the road or actually even before then you're seeing kids mosh and stage dive or your first impressions when you first witnessed that firsthand it was well, we first witnessed it in the Bay Area with Metallica and Exodus and them in the show early shows because, you know, we had Ruthie's Inn was just like a small, intimate club that was like our breeding ground in our home. All the bands mm -hmm. went to all the shows. We all hung out around the bar. You know, we all drank. We all went to the same after parties at the same houses, at the same studios. So it, it, it and the Bay Area was really you know, spawned off a lot of punk rock was pretty big in the early eighties. So I think maybe it carried over the thrash of the attitude of punk and the scene of thrashing around and stage diving and all that stuff. So we were kind of used to it a little bit, but we weren't used to the sound that was being done with it, like Exodus and, and Metallica. And so we knew that, First, we knew that we all knew each other and we it wasn't about hurting each other. It was about having fun, letting out aggression. But then going to other places in the world and experiencing it was different because sometimes it got a little violent and fights broke out, you know. But over time, it did become everybody understood that this was a place to go release your energy. We're all here for the same thing, the music, the mm -hmm. bands, supporting them, having fun not to go there and start trouble and get in a fight. That's not what it was about. And I think everybody kind of understood that over time, you know? And they still do. It's it's the safest place, yeah. a metal show where to mosh. I mean, even when I saw you guys in Montreal with Death Angel and, uh, and Exodus, you see the moshing happening, you see the wall of doom or whatever they call it, the, the wall of death. Wall of death. And Yeah, I mean, even, even girls out there, you know, that are yes. right there in the pit, you know, doing the same things guys are doing stage diving, letting out their same aggressions, you know, like us. And, and, uh, you know, compared to those early eighties, there wasn't many girls at these type of shows compared yeah, to yeah. like today. Oh, absolutely. You know? Um, when you saw Metallica for the first time, did you go, this bad is gonna really be big one day. They're going to be bigger than all of us. And well, there was some, well, there was something, well, they're, they're how fast it, it happened and the attendance grew so quick and so new of a flavor yeah. for me. I was at that point where it almost went over my head, you know, where I was, I was raised by listening to UFO and thin Lizzy and, you know, bands like that, you know, rock bands. And, and I was based on a lot of lead guitar and a lot of vocals. So when all that kind of hit me, it was kind of like over my head, but there was something there like, wow, this people are really enjoying this and expressing themselves in a different way that I've ever seen um, the, from the fans and from the stage. And, and so, you know, you know, it grew really fast. And, you know, and I think the beauty of the Bay is that we were lucky enough to have that, but all of us upcoming bands after that, didn't try to sound like Metallica, didn't try to sound like Exodus. Everybody kind of was in their own way interpreting, you know, the attitude, the aggression, the music into what they do. And I think like bands like Death Angel, Forbidden, you know, all us bands, Exodus, and to this day, everybody had their own identity and stuck with their own identities. You know, it's amazing. Uh, when Kill em All came out, I bought that album when it first was released. I never thought they'd be as big as they were. I thought they'd always retain at that sort of motorhead level because as, as you mentioned, it was just so in your face, so aggressive, 
so fast. We never heard it before. We couldn't, we couldn't uh, understand it at first, right? But yeah, I mean, I, I guess it was because of the Black Album, right? The big hits that just ex- made the band explode globally. So yeah, I mean, for that kind of music, you know, Venom, of course, you know, that was to me, you know, at that time too extreme for me. But Metallica had something about the vocals just yeah. grabbed you. It, it had a good message you know uh you you really into the lyrics and and had a little bit of melody in there yeah yeah you know which true. was for me i was like okay I, I i'm feeling it you know how much pressure did you get over the from the labels to get that you know enter sandman hit that big massive global hit that crosses over into every genre of music were they pressuring you guys to do something like that Tons of it because not at first, because when we signed with Megaforce, the legacy came out on Megaforce, you know, distributed by Atlantic. But I think by the second or third record, um, we were straight on to Atlantic. And so once we had Atlantic working with us, they had an AR guy, and we'd never had an AR guy. And that was the guy that would always be going, okay, well, what could I bring to radio? You know, what's yeah. the video? You know, what is the radio song? And we're like, oh, man, I don't radio. What are you talking about? It's, it was, you know, what is a radio song? Obviously, OK, let's listen. Oh, it's a ballad or it's something slower. It's definitely not the fast stuff we're writing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we had them breathing down us at the time. And we were young and I don't know, naive or, you know, maybe influential by what they thought, because we thought, they worked with all these other bands that got platinum records. They got they got their gold records and platinum records on their wall. They must know what they're talking about. <laughs> so, okay, so let's listen to them. And and so what do you want? Mm-hmm. You know, and okay, so we need to try to write a ballad. Okay, let's try that, you know, and, and we did our best. And, you know, in those early years, those guys pushed radio. We had success at radio and MTV getting our videos played. You know, and those were the days, you know, uh, getting record budgets were huge. Video budgets were huge. You made you got in debt really fast as a young band. You had to succeed. You had to sell records to pay them debts, you know, Um, and we thought, okay, well, we have to do something to get to a bigger mass audience like all those guys with the gold records on their walls. Mm. I guess the radio is the way to go, you know. Because MTV was so new, all we had was like uh, like satellite radio that you couldn't see videos, but you could hear it through the television, yeah. like on Channel Zero or you know on satellite <laughs> radio or whatever it was. I forgot what it was called back then, you know. And uh, that was it. So over the years, you know, we still probably got flack for doing it back then, but we didn't know any better, and we were trying to figure out a way to succeed. A lot of bands from the legacy era, we'll call it the early 80s, their biggest albums, and they still were paying them off like 20, 30 years later. Was that the case for Testament, where you still haven't recouped or you have recouped? No, we recouped on the Atlantic stuff quite a while ago, Okay. Um, surprisingly enough. But we had sold enough records to recoup. And I, I think the, the, the worst part about it was, is when we cut our first record deals, digital wasn't even a a, something that you talked about or put in in the in the Mm -hmm. contract um so obviously once digital started happening we we had a terrible royalty coming in that paid digitally so it was never gonna catch up at that point it had to be physical records you had to sell and you know and i think in our fifth record you know we'd had a six record deal the fifth record you know, times changed those nineties with Nirvana's and all that and radio changed and everything changed um, for us. So I think at that point, Atlantic really didn't support many of the thrash bands they had signed and supported in the early eighties, mid eighties, moving into the nineties, they kind of put us all to the side and either maybe dropped some of the bands. So over time we have never had a, any help or support from them you know I, I to this day i still get upset because 
you know, once we started retaining the rights back, all of a sudden now they wanted to have a conversation. Oh, okay. So what do you want? Okay, we'll offer you a box set. Well, what is a box set? To In these days, physicals aren't big, it's digital. You know, so that doesn't do us any good. And where were you for our 10-year anniversary, our 20-year anniversary, our 30-year anniversary? Where are those records and re-releases? <laughs> you guys didn't care at all. And now you're offering a box set just for us to continue with you guys. And so we said, absolutely not. We knew Nuclear Blast was going to do what needed to be done with it. We'll give you the rights. They're going to put out the records, the box sets. Go, We'll get a better digital rate with a new contract given these to them. And it's a separate contract, our Atlantic records, than our within what we have with them on the other records. So it was a whole new negotiation, which we made sure, you know, our digitals, we got paid really well, which we are now Good. for those old records. Nice. And it's a digital world. You know, I got actually, you know, I, I don't use, I never use Spotify. And you know, I always heard the nightmare didn't pay. So I just, you know, I never supported it. And, you know, our label came to us and said, you know, have you ever looked at Spotify, what you do there? And I'm like, no. And so he said, okay, open it up and put your name in and look what, how many people, you, listeners you have a month. And I'm like, okay, is that good? <laughs> he goes, well, okay, let's look at your other artists that you grew up with and some other bands in your genres, put their names in. And I was really surprised how well Testament has followers. I mean, we're up to like 3 million followers a month. Yeah. Right. You know, compared to a lot of the other bands, they're like a million or under. And I was like, wow. Okay, that opened my eyes. Digital world is something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, okay. We need a better royalty rate digitally going <laughs> forward now. You know, <laughs> people are downloading songs. Okay. You know, thank so, you for opening my eyes. Know, Please send me the check. Thank yeah. you. Thank <laughs> you for opening my eyes. And yeah, exactly. And so now we have a great royalty rate a great label that's pushing physical and digital for us. Mm -hmm. And it's where it should be. All of our, everything we've ever done is going to be at nuclear blast. Good. Good to hear. They're a great label. Love nuclear blast. Um, yeah. The, the legacy of the new order. My last question, the legacy of the new order album, since it's being remastered. Well, well, for me, that was because the first record, The Legacy, I was singing Steve Souza's songs. He wrote mm -hmm. all of that. I participated on one song on that record, Do or Die. And so the new order is where I got to participate. And I remember we went to Europe with the Anthrax and we we're on the back of the bus, young kids drinking at an acoustic guitar and said, OK, let's let's work on their next record. You know, when we get done with this tour. Let's make another record. So we wrote that record on an acoustic guitar in the back of a bus. And I got to at least sit with them and work out vocals. So that was the first time I got to participate writing songs with the guys. So for me, that was my debut freshman record was the new order. So for me, that's, that is my legacy starting from where my first contribution to thrash metal was that record. Cool. Cool. On that note, Everybody, it's going to be released. Gosh, I don't even have the dates for it. It's, it's soon, right? Uh, it's really soon. If it's this month or next couple of weeks, I know pre-orders. Pre-orders are now. That's very, for sure. very yes. well. Yes. Yeah. Legacy. Yeah. So it, it was doing very, I know they sold out of them and they're printing more. I guess it's a really good problem they have. Yeah. So they're, they're going to be still available at Nuclear Blast and also TestamentLegions.com. Yeah, somebody asked me, are they going to be available on CD or you don't know yet? No, they will. But we're, the the vinyl, the two remasters, we took, um, we, there's there's 20 page booklets in each Ooh. one of those vinyl releases. And we went, me and Eric dug in years of Tupperwares that we've been just throwing things in in the garage. And I actually got about 20 boxes of stuff for our first attorney slash manager, which kept <laughs> very good records and kept files of everything. And that, when I went through them, I found the original contracts, the original merch deals. I found the, the letter that um, our manager sent to Johnny Z pushing our legacy demo saying, hey, wow. I'm going to send you this demo. And if you have any interest, please reach out to us. I mean, I found all this stuff. So we have we put together a really cool 20-page booklet of old photos, old contracts, original lyrics that we found in there, 
on that we hand written them out. So there's a lot of cool stuff. So I think we're really pushing that first and then the, the CDs will follow up after that. Okay. So that's good to know. A lot of people want to know. That's good. Johnny Z rest in peace. A great guy. Uh, you know, he just, I got to be friends with Johnny in his later years and you know what, what a character, what a person, what a visionary. What, what a visionary, what a mind. I mean, I was fortunate enough to start a management company with him and Maria Ferrero. And so I talked to Johnny multiple times a day, every day, and we became very good friends. We went on vacations together. My wife and Marcia, we all went places together and, and had a great time and was fortunate to go spend time with Johnny, um, you know, before he passed. I got to see him shortly before he passed and you know i'm glad I, i'm glad i went there and got to say goodbye he called me i believe on the I, I believe died on a monday or tuesday and he called me on that saturday and i i still have it saved on my voicemail so i can hear him go back and hear him just tell me chuck call me you know we need to talk you know and you know he said some pretty great emotional stuff to me and I, I'm I got it forever on my on my phone. I always go back and hear his voice. Yeah, rest in peace, Johnny Chuck. A pleasure. That's right. And uh, again, September twelfth, Clash of the Titans tour North America, Testament Creator and Possessed. Then November twenty first, you guys go to Europe, Anthrax Creator and Testament. They're adding Anthrax. That's right. They're moving Possessed, and of course the summer festivals and the remasters. Go pre order them now. And thank you very much yeah. for your time. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy, for having me. It's always wonderful to talk to you. All right. Have yourself a good day. Talk soon. All right. Cheers.